It was a dull October evening. Shrill winds blew over the Chilterns, and a fine mist of rain flew in the faces of the patrons who braved the darkness to show their haggard faces in the George and Dragon public house. It was the year of our Lord 1780, and despite the foul weather, business was booming. Suki, the teenage barmaid, wished it wasn't. The landlord didn't own her. He had hired her from a pool of willing candidates because she had a beautiful singing voice and the kind of awkward confidence that the job called for. But sometimes it felt like he did. It was always fill this and empty that. Sometimes he sent her down into the cellar to track down a special bottle for the well-off visitors that stopped in as they traversed the rugged landscape. She hated it down there. Sometimes she thought she heard voices. On this particular night, the Georgian dragon was short-staffed because John Woodinge had fallen from his horse and broken his ankle. Old John was the pub's owner, a member of the gentry who had fallen on hard times and established himself in that peaceful corner of Buckinghamshire. Unable to walk and ordered by the physician to take to his bed until the bones started to fuse back together, he had left Suki and her brother Thomas in charge of the place. But Thomas was as much used to Suki as a chastity belt would be to Molly Ford, the wretched whore who plied her wares and her body under the eaves of the stables when the dragon's drinkers went out to check on their horses. She wasn't allowed inside the pub, a respectable establishment, unless she was invited inside by one of the patrons and led into one of the private rooms that travellers called home when they were passing through. More ale, wench! Suki sighed adjusted her dress and carried a flagon across to the three young men who had been sitting by the fire since the sun had gone down. "'I'll have none of that, George Barber,' she said, filling the young man's cup while avoiding his eyes. "'I knew your mother, you know. She wouldn't stand for this.' "'Aye,' George replied. "'Pap, it's a good thing she's with the Lord.' "'Oh, damn the Lord,' said the lad to his right. His name was Harry Baker. "'It's not the Sabbath. The Lord can wait.' The only lord around here is that Lord Dashwood, said the third. Suki turned to face him, a scarlet flush stealing its way onto her face. And I'll have none of your blasphemy either, James Smith, Suki said. I know your mother too, need I? But she was interrupted as Jim scowled and reached round to pinch her on the backside. Suki flinched, spilling her ale onto the table and into his lap. I hope you're going to clean that up, Barbara said. Oh, go hang, Suki said. I have other customers to serve. And she did too. Despite the inclement weather and the fact that there were a couple of competing inns in the village, the Georgian Dragon was ever popular. It was where the labourers went to relax after a hard day's work on the fields. Suki preferred to listen than to speak, and it meant that she got to hear most of the gossip in the village. The Georgian Dragon was the closest thing the village had to a newspaper. There was a sudden gust of wind and the squall of a small-scale tempest as the door opened and a stranger walked into the pub. The punters paused their conversations and looked up appraisingly before turning their eyes away from the door and back to the faces of their drinking buddies or the playing cards on the booze-stained tables. The breeze caught the candles and blew a third of them out. "'Can a man get a bite to eat in this godforsaken village?' The stranger's voice was well-educated, with a hint of something almost foreign and exotic. He was young. Not as young as the three boys from the village, but he had a short mess of unruly brown hair and piercing blue eyes that shone with a fierce intensity. He had a good-natured smile on his face and was dressed well in the luxurious vestments of the wealthy. His eyes alighted on the various tables in the semi-gloom before settling on the little Suki. Better known by her elders as Susan Keane, the daughter of one of Lord Dashwood's liverymen. You there, he said. Oh, my dear, what brings you to a place like this? No, no, never mind that. What have you got in your pantry? Suki readjusted her apron again and forced the biggest smile that she could muster onto her tired, duty-worn face. She spoke to the man as she walked over to the fire lit a piece of kindling and used it to re-illuminate the snuffed candles. 
It was a job that she did so often that she wasn't even aware she was doing it. If it please you, sir, she said, we've got bread, mutton and cheese. We may also have some pigeon, some eggs and some veal. If it please me, he repeated with mock politeness. And is it good? I do say it's the best eating this side of the Y. Someone laughed into his pint and someone else was talking loudly about the highwaymen who were still rumoured to be at work in the roads over by Aylesbury. Around them, the drinkers were still drinking and the talkers were still talking, but he was a stranger to these parts, and the locals couldn't help stealing the occasional glance. "'I'll take a plate of whatever you can give me,' the stranger said. "'And brandy. Bring me brandy. As you wish.' Thomas Keane had been at the bar, supping on a drink of his own and observing the situation. It was he who descended the steps into the cellar to bring out the brandy. He had no fear of the darkness. Susie was left to busy herself in the pantry, and then in the kitchen. She emerged several minutes later with a platter for the visitor, who'd seated himself in a corner and who was already smoking shag tobacco from an ornate pipe. "'Here you go, kind sir,' Suki said. Forgive me for prying, but do you have good coin? Aye, said the man. I have coin enough. Tell me, what do they call you? Suki adjusted her dress again for the fourteenth time that evening and said, They call me Suki. Suki, the man repeated thoughtfully. Tis a beautiful name for sure. He paused for a moment to take another lungful of the tobacco plant. Then he said, "'You've no cause to ask for my name, but I shall give it to you anyway. I am Charles Dashwood. Perhaps you've heard of my uncle Francis?' "'Lord Dashwood,' Suki murmured. "'Aye,' the stranger repeated. "'The very same. See how I sign my name.' He reached into the pockets of his long coat and drew out an old, stained-looking letter. The signature was scrawled in black ink in a large, untidy hand. "'Please, sir,' Suki said. "'I can't read.' Dashwood paused for a moment, and then started laughing, gulping up huge lungfuls of the in-stale air. "'Oh, my dear,' he said. "'I might have known. "'Then you must keep that piece of paper, "'and you must one day learn to read it "'so that you can see that my name is what I say it is. "'I say it again.' I am Charles Dashwood, and my uncle is Lord Francis. Suki had heard of Lord Francis Dashwood, of course. He owned the whole village, though he hadn't been seen in public since before she'd reached womanhood. But that didn't matter. Suki had heard the tales. It was an open secret throughout the village that Lord Dashwood was the leader of the Hellfire Club. Dashwood along with a number of other preeminent men from Buckinghamshire and nearby Berkshire, used to meet at the Medmenham Abbey on the banks of the River Thames, for nights of drunkenness, debauchery and devil worship. Their motto was Fe si qui voudras, which meant do as you please, and it was said that Sir Dashwood himself was the most blasphemous of all. He had administered the sacrament to his tame baboon, Later, he had created work for the people of the village by having them hollow out the hellfire caves, barely a stone's throw away from the Georgian dragon. And then the hellfire caves became the new home of the hellfire club, and that was when things became very strange indeed. They, the same they that drank themselves into stupors in the front room of the Georgian dragon, said that the caves were a breeding ground of moral turpitude. The men who'd helped to build it said that devils and demons were carved into the walls and that they moved around when no one was looking. There was a stream somewhere, far beneath the surface, which they called the Styx. And deep down there, in the darkness, there was a temple, located directly beneath the church and its golden ball which graced the hilltop and dominated the skyline. I've been down there, you know. Dashwood said, as though he'd read and interrupted her thoughts. The temple. It's hell, quite literally. Heaven above, hell below. They worshipped Christ on high and the devil in the temple beyond the sticks. 
"'You barely look old enough, sir,' replied Suki. "'Oh, no, no,' he said, waving a hand dismissively "'and coming dangerously close to sending his drink tumbling onto the floor. "'Not to one of the ceremonies. "'There were rumours about the ceremonies, too. "'The members of the Hellfire Club were said to have taken young girls down there "'to sacrifice their virginity. "'That's what happened to Molly Ford.' Suki shivered. I shouldn't like to think of such things. Then you won't want to hear about the ghost of Paul Whitehead, Dashwood said. More's the pity. Sir, I've heard tell of Mr. Whitehead, Suki said. And pray, tell me what you've heard. They say he was a poet, Suki replied. That he was, Dashwood said. And, like all poets, he was a madman and a lecher. He was also the steward of the Hellfire Club. He interrogated the new recruits and scored them on their ability to swallow port and claret. He was also my uncle's lover. Suki made a sign of the cross and darted her eyes nervously around, searching for her brother, and delighted only on the three boys from the village, who were watching the conversation and quaffing their ale in near silence. It's been six years since Whitehead passed. Dashwood continued, and my uncle's health has been deteriorating ever since. Did you know that he left my uncle his heart? His heart? His heart, Dashwood repeated. He left it to my uncle in his will. His body was buried in Teddingham, but his heart? His heart was buried in the depths of the mausoleum. Suki shivered again. Then she took herself and Charles Dashwood by surprise. She started to sing. My lodging it is on the cold ground, she began, her voice wavering as she strained to hit the higher notes. And oh, very hard is my fare, but that which troubles me most is the unkindness of my dear. Yet still I cry, O oh, turn, love, and prithee, love, turn to me, for thou art the man that I long for, and alack, what remedy. Her face flushed, and she readjusted her dress, clearly uncomfortable on the receiving end of Dashwood's intense blue eyes. Dashwood smiled at her and said, I beg of you, please continue. Suki paused for a moment and took in a lungful of breath before continuing. I'll crown thee with a garland of straw then, she sang, and I'll marry thee with a rush ring. My frozen hope shall thaw then, and merrily we shall sing. Oh, turn to me, my dear love, and prithee, love, turn to me. For thou art the man that alone canst procure my liberty. I believe there's one more verse, my girl. I, you speak the truth, Suki said. She raised her voice a little and continued. But if thou wilt harden thy heart still, and be deaf to my pitiful moan, then I must endure the smart still, and tremble in straw alone. Yet still I cry, O oh, turn, love, and prithee, love, turn to me, for thou art the man that alone art, the cause of my misery. When Suki finished, there was silence. Then Dashwood began to clap, breaking the silence, and then suddenly everyone else in the Georgian Dragon was clapping too. It started slow, then swelled, and then overflowed. It wasn't unusual for Suki to sing, but it was unusual for the punters to take an interest. Bravo! Dashwood cried. Marvellous! Fantastic! Spectacular! 
you're too kind, good sir. Sir? Bah! By this time, Dashwood had finished his food and was towards the bottom of his second cup of brandy. Thomas Keene was watching on impatiently. The meal pleased me, Dashwood said, but your company pleased me more. Alas, I must move on. I'm London-bound, and there are men in the city that are desirous of my company. Suki? Suki, Suki, I am pleased to have made your acquaintance. And with that, Charles Dashwood quaffed the rest of his brandy, doffed his cap at the other drinkers, and took his leave of the Georgian dragon. Suki was left to clean his table. Then her brother sent her down into the cellars to bring up more firewood. The fire was blazing, and the hearth already held more wood than the fire needed. It wasn't a necessary task. It was brotherly punishment. And while she was down there, the boys made their plan. Snooty Miss Suki, said George Barber. Too good for the likes of us. Says she, Smith added. I say we teach her a lesson, said Baker. Yes, Barber said. But how? We write her a letter, Smith said. We send her a message from the kindly Charles Dashwood, inviting her first to the Hellfire Caves and from there to London. Nay, Barber said, your plan can never work. What know you of the world of letters? Tis true, Smith replied. I'm not a scholar, but Baker is. James Smith and George Barber turned their troubled faces to Harry Baker, who had a glint in his eyes and who was emptying the last of his ale into the ever-thirsty maw of his mouth. <coughs> Bring me paper, he said. Bring me a quill and some ink. Bring me ale and cheese and bread. Not here, you fool, Barbara said. Let us away. We'll write the note at my house and then have my sister deliver it. And so the plan was formed. And sure enough, less than an hour later, little Cathy Barber had braved the winds and rain, under threat of a bruised arm from her brother, to deliver the letter. As instructed, she handed it over to Suki who was mopping down one of the tables with a piece of rag. "'A letter,' she said incredulously. "'For me. Pray, tell me who it's from.' But Cathy just shook her head and scuttled out into the night. Suki was illiterate, but there were others who weren't, and an old man who had sat quietly in the corner, smoking a pipe and drinking his mead while staring off into the distance, was kind enough to do the honours. "'Let me see now.' said the man, shifting his position to hold the letter up to the flickering light of the candles, which Suki had relit after Cathy Barber had taken her leave. Ah, yes, I have it. What does it say? Patience, dear, the man said. Then he cleared his throat, held the letter up to the light again, and began to read. It says, Suki, my dear, I find your voice enchanting. It won't leave my mind. Your natural beauty is like a ray of light in the darkness. Your hands are as delicate as bone china, and you smell more heaven-sent than the fragrance of foreign lands. I myself am no masterpiece, but I have wealth and status. I can show you the world, if you'll let me. I'm asking you, Suki. To become my wife. If your answer is positive, meet me at the mouth of the Hellfire Caves at midnight in your best dress. My coachman will bear us hence to London, where we shall be married. Yours most affectionately, Charles Dashwood. When the old man finished reading, Suki dropped to the floor in a dead faint. She was woken by her brother, who was applying a damp rag to her forehead and muttering a catechism beneath his breath. When she awoke, she sat bolt upright and a hand flew up to her mouth. "'What is the hour?' she demanded. "'Why, it's an hour until midnight,' her brother replied. "'Only an hour?' Suki said. "'Then I must prepare at once.' "'I don't know about this, Suki,' her brother said. "'I've half a mind to stop you.' 
You just try, she replied, and then she flashed him a look of such ferocity that he backed away a half step before he caught himself. He opened his mouth to say something and then closed it again. That's what I thought. Nothing can stand in the way of love. And so Suki dashed away to the house that she shared with her brother, their father and their elderly aunt, a spinster who was already asleep and who would remain unaware of her niece's fate until she woke the following morning. Suki washed her face in the pail of water, dragged a comb through her thick, unruly hair and then took her best dress out from where it lay in a wooden chest. It was a beautiful dress, one that she had inherited from her late mother and which her aunt had helped her to modify to suit her smaller stature. Soon, from fine white silks, the material alone would have cost her several months' wages from the Georgian dragon. No one in the family seemed to know where the gown had originally come from, and that just made it all the more magical. At the appointed hour, little Suki headed back out into the cold and wandered along the lonely dirt path that led to the caves. The wind was still howling around her, and while the rain had stopped falling from the sky, it still remained in great puddles that she struggled to skirt around in the darkness. From somewhere in the distance, a dog barked. It was at the top of the hour when she arrived, and there was no sign of anyone else in her immediate environment. Suki waited, and then she waited some more. But Charles Dashwood never came. Instead, three others did. It was one o'clock in the morning when Harry Baker, James Smith and George Barber arrived. They had been further into their cups and had lost track of the time. When they talked, they overlapped each other and spoke with slurred voices. We fooled you, Snooky Suki. You're good enough for the likes of us. Your knight in shining armours never loved you. You're nothing but the next Molly Ford. A pox on you and your good-for-nothing brother. The jeers continued, but Suki stopped hearing them. Instead, all she could hear was her own heartbeat as a cold, hard rage took over her. She stooped, bending her knees awkwardly to lower herself in her dress, and she picked up a handful of stones. She picked one out, the sharpest, most jagged-looking one, and pitched it through the air, scoring a glancing blow across Jim Smith's neck. She threw another and then another until she depleted the ammo in her hand. She was stooping again to pick up some more by the time any of the boys had figured out what was happening. It's her! Let's get her! Throw them back at her! But the boys needed no encouragement on that front. Harry Baker was already on his knees, scooping up a handful of stones of his own. This being the ground outside the mouth of the Hellfire Caves, there wasn't exactly a shortage. Then the other two boys were beside him, and soon the air was thick with stones that fell down around them in a hail of pain. Smith took the brunt of the blows, partly because he was the taller of the three, and partly because the other two were using him for cover. And then there was a shrill cry, a heavy thud, and sudden silence. The three boys looked at each other uneasily, and ran in the direction of the sound. Little Suki Keen was lying face down among the rocks. She wasn't moving. What happened? What do you think? Is she breathing? Baker kneeled by her side and gave her a brief once-over. But he didn't really know what he was looking for. He found the cause, though. One of the rocks had caught her a good one on the side of the head, rending a gash across her temple and sending her tumbling to the ground. It looked as though she'd hit the other side of her head on the ground as she'd reached it. Well, is she breathing? Give a man some space. I have no idea, Baker said, but I don't think so. Oh, we need to get out of here. But what about Suki? What about her? We should take her back with us, right? No, Baker said. It's too risky. Someone might see us. We'll leave her here at the mouth of the cave. If she comes to, she can walk home. And if she doesn't, well, no one need know we were here. And so the plan was formed, and Baker removed a knife from his pocket and cut each of them on the palms of their hands. They pressed their hands together in turn to seal their oath and to promise silence. Then they went home. 
In the morning, a sad sun dawned over West Wickham, and the rains came down like the rage of a vengeful god. Little Suki wasn't found until the afternoon, when a couple of the children found her body during a game of hide-and-seek. She was soaked through to the bone, her china-white skin and her best dress making her look more like a ghost than a physical being. The children raced into the village and started screaming for help, and within half an hour the bells were ringing and the whole community had poured out into what passed for a village square. When it was discovered that little Suki had sustained an injury to the side of her head, the atmosphere turned sour and the violence threatened to spill over into an outright lynch mob. And to begin with, there was only one suspect on everyone's minds. It's that no good Charles Dashwood, Thomas Keane shouted, beside himself with grief. That afternoon he'd been taken to see his sister's body, and the guilt and the rage had almost taken him to an early grave along with her. He lured my sister out here and then... But he couldn't finish that awful thought. And so, with suspicions on Charles Dashwood, Lord Francis Dashwood himself was summoned from his repose. He arrived as dusk was beginning to settle, borne to the village in the back of a cab. Suki's own father, the liveryman to Lord Francis, had overcome his grief to fulfil his duty, bearing the elderly landowner into his village to dispense with justice. Lord Francis was wearing his formal robes, and they served to offset the sickness and the sallowness of his face. He might have been old, he might have been on the verge of death, but he was still in charge of the land on which they stood. Begin at the beginning, Lord Francis said. He was reclining in the back of his cab and leaning out of the window to talk to the locals. I want to know everything. And so Thomas Keane started at the beginning, and Lord Francis listened to the boy with rapt attention as he recounted the events of the night before. When he got to the arrival of Charles Dashwood, his voice cracked and he couldn't continue. But that didn't matter. Lord Francis had held his hand up for silence. Charles Dashwood, he murmured. There's no such man. But he said he was your nephew, my lord. Then he lied, Lord Francis said. I have no heir. I have no family capable of producing one. Tell me, lad, what did this man look like? Thomas Keane wasn't one for stories, and so his description of the man was fairly rudimentary and could have matched half of the men in the village. It was augmented by a few words from the pub's drinkers, but then memories were hazy at best and not to be trusted in the sober light of day. This man could have been anyone, Lord Francis said. Have you any other clues as to his identity? No, Thomas said. But then he seemed to remember something and to collect himself. Wait, there is one thing. Go on. He produced a note with his signature on it, Thomas said. It's amongst my sister's belongings. No, hold. There was a second note too. The one that summoned my sister to her death. Bring me these two notes, said Lord Francis and Thomas Keane departed at once and returned with the two notes of which he had spoken. He had handed them in through the coach's window, and Lord Francis buried his nose amongst the papers. Hmm, he said at length. It seems we have a problem. These two letters were written by two different hands. This one, the newer one which summoned your sister to the caves, was written by a younger hand. A steady hand. The other, well, I seem to recognise it. It may be signed in the name of Charles Dashwood, but this is the hand of someone else entirely. This is the hand of Paul Whitehead. But Paul has been dead these six years. How is this possible? Perhaps he wrote the note before he passed? Perhaps, Lord Francis said. 
But why then did he sign with a fictitious name? I have no answer for you, sir. This vexes me, Lord Francis said. He looked even paler than he had been when he'd first arrived. He rubbed a handkerchief across his forehead to mop the sweat off. I must consider this in private. This news is troubling. And he looked troubled too. In fact, he looked as though he'd seen a ghost. The next witness to be called was little Kathy Barber, but her brother had already put the fear of God into her and instructed her about the lie she was to tell. By now, Kathy had figured out the truth, but she both loved and feared her brother and was willing to perjure herself to save his neck. When they asked who had given her the letter, she answered that a tall, distinguished gentleman had handed it to her from a cab window and asked her to deliver it with all haste. And there, with no further evidence available, the investigation stalled. Unfortunately for little Suki, justice was difficult in the shadow of the Chiltern Hills, and while efforts were made to track down Charles Dashwood, or whoever he was, they came to nothing. There was no report of him in the other inns, and nor had he appeared in London society. Stranger still, Molly Ford swore blind that she had been standing at the stables all night, plying her wares, so to speak, and that she had seen the man neither enter nor leave the Georgian Dragon. Meanwhile, life in the village seemed to get back to normal, at least for the most part. For James Smith, however, life was anything but. The day after Suki's body was discovered, he came down with a fever which left him sweating despite the chill. Even with his bed placed close to the fire, the chill refused to die, and before another twenty-four hours had passed, it had taken over the rest of his body. It looked like he was losing the battle. There was no doctor in the village, and so one was brought in from Great Missenden. It didn't take him long to make his diagnosis. The boy has an infection, the doctor said, a bad one, a malady of the blood. Tell me, what caused this cut on the boy's neck? But no one in George's family could answer, and the two boys who had shared his secret weren't permitted to stand at his bedside. Jim's condition continued to deteriorate, even with all of the medicine that the doctor could give him, and the passage of a couple of days was enough to seal his fate. He died on a Tuesday, less than a week after little Suki passed, and he was buried on the Friday. His family couldn't afford to pay for the burial. But the undertaker agreed to do it for free. George Barber was the next to die. He had heard about what happened to Jim, and thought that he could outrun death by stealing a horse and riding it at a full speed for the capital. Instead, he had been captured along the way, brought back to West Wickham, and held before a judge. His family had hoped for leniency, especially because it was his first offence, but he was out of luck and ended up in front of Old Justice Stonehouse. He was known by the unpleasant sobriquet of the Noose Judge, a nickname that he had earned through his unremitting habit of passing down the harshest of sentences. For George Barber, no exception was made. He was sentenced to be hanged from the neck until he was dead, and the sentence was carried out forthwith. His final words, which were only heard by the hangman as he pulled the lever to open the trap door, were, We killed her. Harry Baker, the writer of the letter and the architect of Little Suki's doom, lived a long and healthy life, but it was unclear whether he was even aware of it. The poor boy lost his mind and lived out the rest of his days in a sanatorium, where he was the subject of an endless stream of medical procedures that culminated in a botched lobotomy that silenced his hand and his tongue for good. He grew old there, and was eventually buried beneath the oaks out back after no one claimed his body. Lord Francis passed too. Although he held on for another year as his health continued to deteriorate, Little Suki's death seemed to have had a harsh effect on him, for he retreated to his manor and rarely ventured forth into the grounds. Stranger still, there were rumours in the village that an apparition, purported to be the ghost of Paul Whitehead, had been spotted wandering the grounds. 
Suki's father saw him several times, and it was said that the shock combined with the grief pushed him over the edge. He was found dead one morning in the stables with the horses that he so loved. He reeked of cheap spirits, but there was no sign of whatever had killed him. It was written off as an accident, but the gossips called it a suicide. His meagre assets were quickly claimed by the Crown, and the Church refused to bury his body in sacred ground. Instead, he was buried without ceremony at a crossroads, so that if his spirit came back, it wouldn't know which direction to head in. With time, life in the village went back to normal, although stories started to spread of the ghost of a teenage bride in a white dress, who could be seen in the darkness of the hellfire caves by those brave enough to venture there after midnight. There were few who met that criteria. Time passed, and the 18th century rolled into the 19th century, and then to the 20th. Little Suki was forgotten about, first because of the slow march of time, and later by the sheer number of young men from the village who gave their lives in the First and Second World Wars. Meanwhile, the country changed around them, and the horse-drawn carriages were replaced by motor vehicles, while television antennas sprung up on the sides of the rural houses. In the 1960s, an American called Jerry Pascal was visiting the area. Pascal had heard Suki's story from the lips of one of the perpetual old men who still drank themselves silly in the Georgian Dragon. The locals had said that he had braved the caves at midnight and returned to his hotel room disappointed, only to have a visitation that night. He woke to feel clammy, ice-cold hands on his forehead, and as he slowly rose to full consciousness, they passed along and reached his neck. He started to choke, and that was when movement came back to him and he was able to reach across to turn his bedside lamp on. The feeling of the hands disappeared along with the darkness, and he sat upright in his bed for a while, turning it all over in his head and trying to figure out what was real and what was nightmare. Eventually, he turned the light off and tried to settle back in again. He'd been lying there for a couple of minutes when he spotted something over by the door. It was a light, like the light from his lamp, but at a fraction of the size. Though it grew bigger as he watched it, it was opaque and pearly, hovering in the air like a will-o'-the-wisp. Again, Pascal turned the lamp on, and the light vanished only to reappear once more when the room was plunged into darkness. By now he was wide awake, and while he felt the fear of the devil at his heels, he picked up the courage to approach it. As he got closer, it grew brighter until an eerie figure in white was illuminated. It looked like a teenage girl who was wearing an old-fashioned dress, something from the 1700s, perhaps. As soon as he reached the girl, he was overtaken by a wave of cold that left him breathless. His limbs were heavy, too heavy for him to hold them up, and he felt himself collapse to his knees. The light grew brighter, and he crawled backwards like a crab towards the safety of his bedside lamp. When he switched the lamp back on, the apparition was gone. Pascal kept the light on for the rest of the night, but he didn't go back to sleep again. He left early in the morning and vowed never to return. The room hasn't been slept in since, and even the staff at the Georgian Dragon don't like to go in there, especially at night. There are rumours of a ghost that haunts it, a ghost in a flowing white gown.